Hello, I'm Cindy Cooper, and welcome to Honor Roll Talk, Spreading Our Wings with Site-Specific Theater. Honor Roll is an advocacy and action group of women plus playwrights over 40 and our women plus allies over 40. The term women plus refers to a spectrum of gender identification that includes women, non-binary identifiers, and trans. Our goal is to advance our inclusion in theater. We are the generation excluded at the outset of our careers because of sexism, now overlooked because of ageism. Honor Roll celebrates diversity in theater and works to eliminate age discrimination as it intersects with sexism and other biases, including those based on race, gender identity, ethnicity, faith, socioeconomic status, disability, and sexual orientation in the American theater and beyond. The Executive Committee of Honor Roll is comprised of playwrights Cheryl Davis, Olga Humphrey, Jackie Reingold, Bela Travis, Diana Yanez, and me. And our presentation has been wonderfully facilitated by playwright Jenny Webb. In talking about site-specific theater today, we invited four outstanding Honor Roll visionaries to join us, Pepper Chambers, Anne Hamburger, Susan Lee, and Judy Tate. We'll also follow with a Q&A and three short popcorn presentations by Melissa Bell, Hortense Gerardo, and Stacey Chagan. Pepper Chambers is an international writer, producer, and educator. She wrote and performed the site-specific From Where to Here, a one-woman show about 1930s migration at the Chandler Museum in Arizona in its exhibit, Picturing Home, Dust Bowl Migrants in Chandler. And we pick up here with her talking about that event. Special about this piece. Aside personally, for me to be an artist in a new home and, and just do everything I love, that was the gorgeous part. But the other beautifully gorgeous part was that we were able to connect with the community. So this show was about the community. Um, Christine had a brilliant idea. She sent letters to all the people that participated in the uh, oral histories. Some of those families came. One family brought, brought 13 people or so, and I got to hug them and talk to them. And it was just fantastic. And we did talkbacks after, and people were like, yeah, I remember that when that happened. And my grandpa came and my mom came and it was, it was gorgeous. And um, yeah, the museum was open to it. Christine was like, I don't know what you're talking about, but we're gonna go for it. And <laughs> it, was, it was beautiful. We need more people like that. <laughs> how did you um, how did you uh, work in the museum? Because like you, it went from like exhibit to exhibit. Can you explain that aspect yeah. of it? Yes, the space is very intimate, and so it's it's a kind of a walking museum. And um, and so what I did was I used the 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 exhibit part as as the backdrop to the story. So for example, there was one area that talks about the, the San Marcos Hotel and there was this beautiful China. And so I stood in front of the hotel, I stood in front of that China as though, you know, then I was in the hotel. Then when I moved, then I had the audience move with me and I would say, you know, I'm looking for my brother over here. Can you please come along? And I would, I would guide them along. And then there was this uh, hanging cotton sack of cotton, which was so powerful. And I spoke about picking cotton and starving and how do we, you know, how do we live in this very tough time? Then I went them around a corner and then there was another part, another part. So each, each beautiful piece, this museum, this exhibit was so curated so beautifully and so visually clothes on hanging on uh, clothes lines, beautiful pictures of children, um, and I just used those as the story points and had the audience follow me around until we got to the end. And there was this awesome trailer, like a live-in trailer. And I went in there and then I picked my head out and did all of that. That's great. And you described just quickly um, that there were there was a, a paucity of performing spaces there in Chandler. So you yeah. created one. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. I created. Yeah. Do you mean going to the space and and and? No, I mean in other places. You said there was a theater where, but you couldn't perform there. 
Oh, um, oh, only because I'm new and I'm, I where, where to go, what to do. I don't know, but I, I saw this space and it, and it, and it inspired me, but there's, and it's interesting the theater spaces here. I, I find that there are not many. <laughs> and, um, and so I've done this before, you know, living in, in LA taught you and New York, if you want to do something, you got to find a way. And, um, but like the house that I did at the play that I did in the mansion, same thing, like let's turn this into something else. Um, my producing partner, Nicole, is on the call as well. And we've done site specific and yeah. uh, we both moved to Europe and she's still in Prague. And thank you, Nicole, for coming. And we did, uh, we created four shows in uh, site specific. So I just, I love it. And I kind of go where the opportunity is when, because we know being in theaters can be restricting sometimes. So let's go and do stuff in places where, you know, where there's an opportunity that others may not think. Okay, so we're going to come back to you, but I want to kind of keep moving forward in our little round Zoom table. But um, I think the point that um, Tepper made about the the spaces and New York is a perfect segue to Ann Hamburger. You know, theater is uh, is just so hard, and um, you know we keep hearing about how. Uh, Many places are, you know, becoming more restricted and we're in a group that has been marginalized a lot. So how can we marshal all um, other resources? Well, Anne has been doing this for like about 35 years. Um, she's the executive artistic director of On Guard Arts, a company she founded in 1985. Um, she's a pioneering force in the field of site-specific theater. If you mention site-specific theater, almost anybody, they will mention Anne or On Guard. She commissions writers, directors, composers, and designers to create groundbreaking work using the city as their stage. Um, they've received six OBs, two drama desks, and um, a special outer critics circle award and uh, their um, motto is uh, on guard art chooses the city as our stage so oh, and <laughs> let me ask you how many pieces how many pieces have you done how did you get involved in site <laughs> You know. I don't even know um you know i thought what i do in this short period of time because i obviously have a very you know, 38 years is a long time. <laughs> anyway, um, as I talked about three three pieces, one that was in 1990, one that was during the pandemic, and one that we're going to be doing. In this That's operation. great. So, um, and there's a person who's on this, who was in the piece I did in 1990, Julia Brothers. So I was very happy to see her show up. So in, 19, in 1990, we did a piece. I brought Reza Abdo to New York. I don't know if you all know who he is, but he's, he was a, a real iconoclast and visionary Iranian director, gay, um, unfortunately died of AIDS, but I met him in LA. He has a museum exhibit that's still traveling around the world. And um, I drove around in my car in my car with him and said, I want you to fall in love with the neighborhood. And he fell in love with the meatpacking district, which at the time uh, actually had meat packers do, uh, doing and, you know, pal tusks hanging outside of meat lockers. And then at night it was a uh, uh, transvestites would, um, would be selling their wares. And, um, and we did a piece called Father Was a Peculiar Man that was an adaptation of the brothers Karamazov with 60 performers and a marching band that took place over the course of four square blocks with a 120 foot table that went down Little West 12th Street and a meat cleaver and a chandelier that hung across the street. And um, there's actually a film was made about it. Of course, when I was doing this show, I had absolutely no idea that we'd be talking about it so many years later. But it was an extraordinary experience and Julia was Miss, were you Miss America, Julia? I mean, you were Miss Miss I, was Miss, I was Miss Arizona, <laughs> and, I, and I was voted I Miss. I was voted uh, like the Miss Popularity or something because I shared my drugs. <laughs> I had, um, we had a, an actress, Anita Durst, on the film, and Anita who was dressed up as Marilyn Monroe and arrived in a Cadillac convertible. It was wild. So. You know, that was like the early days of Longer Arts when you could actually live in a world where you could actually even 
even though it was very difficult, uh, pull stuff like that off, you know. Um, and there are lots of huge outdoor um, kind of spectacle driven productions with directors like Tina Landau, Anne Bogard, um, and playwrights like Chuck Me, Mac Wellman. Fast forward, the pandemic. <laughs> so I'm skipping over many years. But um, when the pandemic happened and all the theaters shut down, I was like, girlfriend, you got this. And so I worked with um, John Eisner, a former director of Lark, um, who's since become Ongaro's creative producer in residence, and this brilliant creator, designer, uh, director named Irina Kruschelina. Um, and um, we took over a 4,500 square foot empty store um, in uh, Brookfield Place, the mall. And I asked a dozen playwrights um, who were both like very well known, like Emily Mann, um, great performers like Lisa Jesse Peterson, early career writers like Rahana Mirza, to each send me back three minutes uh three minutes about what are the I asked them the question what are you dreaming about right now and we recorded them and each playwright got their own room if you want to go on Ongard Arts website you can see the designs and stuff and the audience it was 2021 and so the pandemic was still in full 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 blown and audiences came to Arts Bookfield and there were two of the rooms were in the mall and then you went back into this store and people pulse through it two at a time. And it was, was sold there. out, as I recall. It was, it was free, but it was sold out before the press even hit, which was really <laughs> unfortunate. And we wanted to extend it, but Arts Brookfield wouldn't let us because it was free and they it was just going to cost them a boatload of money. And then I tried to move it, but um, I couldn't uh, I couldn't find a real estate developer who would give us space at a reasonable cost. And we even had commercial producers who were interested, but we couldn't pull it off. Um, so um, I'm not gonna answer like technical questions like at the moment, city permissions, that kind of thing. So um, I, I just rather first talk artistically. Um, um, and then and then the, thir the show that we have that we're doing that's coming up is a show called Red Hook History Project. And if you guys know the brilliant uh, writer, Sarah Gansher, who actually has a show at the Vineyard Theater right now, and her co-collaborator, who's an amazing creator, director, storyteller, video designer named uh, Jared Mazzocchi, we're doing a piece that's gonna start at the Harbor Museum and end up at Sunny's, which is um, a kind of bar and a bluegrass center, and it's a hundred years old. And it's gonna tell the story of the woman who um, who ran it, who combated COVID, and she combated Hurricane Sandy when her place was flooded, and she combated um, her, Sandy was her husband who died of cancer, she combated his family who wanted to destroy it and take it over, and um, um, and I'm really excited about this. It's very ambitious and very expensive, and uh, we're we're hoping. So, what's it going to be? What's it going to be in the bar? It's called, well, the working title of it is Red Hook History Project, and um, we're planning to do it in October of 2024. But you know, if you guys want to like get on the on Guard Arts Instagram or join our mailing list, you know, it's spelled the French way: e n g a r d e a r t s dot org. Because we have seven different projects in development. Um, wow. We do one big show every year, but then um, a tremendous amount of really wonderful, wonderful things. And if you go on the On Guard Arts website, you go into production history, you can see pictures of Father Was a Peculiar Man and some of the other shows. So I, don't, I haven't gone on too long. 38 years is hard to confess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <really> great. <laughs> Well, I'm still uh, going strong. I turned 70 this year. I'm full of energy. It's really <laughs> fucking hard, but dude, I'm just plowing forward. <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> so let's move over to Susan Lee for a minute, a uh, few minutes. And um, Susan uh, has, has really mastered the art of adapting scripts for the outdoors, particularly she works with the Hudson Classical Theater Company, and they perform plays each summer at the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Riverside Park in New York City. I try to go every year. Um, 
And uh, so she's the executive artistic director at this company, and they're in their 21st season. So getting close to uh, Anne. And uh, Susan is a, a director and a writer. She's worked a lot in uh, in uh, television as well. And she's uh, a lifetime member of the Writers Guild and has uh, written and produced documentaries for PBS and a uh, memoir for Moore Magazine. So, Susan, how many pieces have you adapted for the outdoors space? <laughs> Yes, so I have uh, uh, adapted eight plays, but six of them specifically for the um, outdoor space. Um, and it, it just sort of happened by accident in a way. Um, in 2013, we thought our beautiful outdoor space would be a perfect place to do the Three Master Tears. Um, with all that, you know, swashbuckling and the, and the, and the costumes, um, it would just be gorgeous. But we read so many adaptations of the Three Master Tears and we couldn't find anything that satisfied us so then I just said okay fine so I, I read the novel and I adapted the play and it was my first you know, adaptation um, but the audience seemed to really respond well to it so then I went ahead and did, did uh, The Three Months of Tears 20 years later which no one has ever adapted for the stage because that book is so hard and so difficult yeah. but um, I, I did it it was uh, the world premiere of that novel and so that was really exciting I saw and then, that Yes. Oh, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And then, <laughs> then I did the three, uh, I did um, Men of the Iron Mask, which is three Dumas novels <laughs> that I had to re read and create those three novels and come up with a 90 minute adaptation, Men of the Iron Mask. And then after that, um, I read um, his classic, The Count of Monte Cristo, which is, of course, the th thousands of pages. Um, and I, I did that. So I did four years of um, Alexander Dumas. Uh, for the space, um, just because I, I just got on a roll. Um, so what what do you have to think about differently when you're writing for an outdoor space as opposed to television or theater? Oh, okay. So the biggest thing um, is, um, for me, it's, it's lighting. There's two things. Um, for outdoor space, uh, we perform, we do three shows in the summer, one in June, July, and August. And we start at 6.30 in the evening. So for the June and July show, we have plenty of light. But by the by August, we start losing light, light pretty rapidly. So we're always fighting light. And we decided, don't fight it. You use that light to, to your advantage. So when we plan our season, we think, what is the best show that we can do in the dark? So doing Romeo mm -hmm. and Juliet in August... At night is the tomb scene, and it works beautifully because it's night and it's kind of, you know, it, it's beautiful. When we did Mary Wise of Windsor, we did the fairies come out with the candles, and you do that at night, and you see these candles and these fairies, and it's just like, it's magical. Um, Using so, candles is a big difference. You can't use a candle in the theater much. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was battery operated, so. <laughs> oh, okay. It was, it, it's, it's a wind. Same <laughs> trick. Well, outdoors, the wind would blow it out. So we couldn't okay. deal with, we couldn't have th them blow out. Um, so, and also too, being outdoors, um, you know, we have this great space. It's a big space, but it's also very intimate. So we have um, actors coming over walls, uh, coming up behind the audiences. We have so many places at entry that, so like when we did Richard III, um, when he has that nightmare of all the ghosts of all the people that he killed come out of the woodwork, literally, they just come out from everywhere and bloody, you know, blood and and there and beside the audiences, our actors are going to spare and die and and it's creepy and you can only do that at night. So having so using the nights outdoors is fabulous actually. It's it's it just creates this great mood that is better than doing it indoors. So um, outdoor theater is it's kind of enhanced when you know what it shows to do in that August um, place because you can work with light and dark. So that's exciting. Um, the second thing um, is, of course, weather. Um, we're always um, um, looking at weather. It's always kind of stressful. Uh, last year, we lost shows with air quality because of the fires in Canada, and that's kind of heartbreaking because to lose for rain, you understand, but for air quality, it's just like, you know, it's a sucker punch. Um, but again, I wanted to be able to use weather to our advantage if, if possible. So one thing we do is like, when it rains in the afternoon, but then it stops, 
we run out there and we clean that stage. We brush off all the um, the puddles, and then we have bags of, of towels. And we're out there and we just clean and clean and clean um, because um, we usually have very large casts. <clears throat> and we also have fight heavy shows. So you can't fight with lots of weapons, with lots of actors on a, a patio that's wet. I mean, it's just not um, feasible. Um, so if we can't get it 100% dry, um, then I go, okay, we'll still do the show and this is how we're going to do it. So I tell the audience, I say, hey, everybody, um, we're going to do the fights, but we're going to do them in Tai Chi speed, meaning they're going to be slow-mo. And so uh -huh. that way our actors can still fight safely. They can still get their footing. And it's and so we can still do their fights, but it's in that beautiful way. And what's so fun is the act, uh, the audience tells us afterwards that they loved the slow motion action because they could see the skill and and the movement and the choreography of of the the fight choreography, um, which they couldn't do in real time because it's so fast. So we turned something that could possibly be a challenge like wet patio into something that actually was kind of beautiful. And so. so you're so, more than a writer. You're like actually making it happen in real time. Outdoor theater, you don't have control over so many things. So you just have to go with the flow and, and figure out how to make it work. So it's a challenge. But when you make it work, it's really, um, you just feel great. And the audience can see it too. And, and they're they're happy that we don't lose shows because we're just pushing it. So, yes. Okay, great. So let, let me keep going around and... and Come to Judy Tate, um, I've known for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hello. How are you? How's everybody? <laughs> so Judy Tate um, is, let me just do a full bio, is a producing artistic director of the American Slavery Project, which is, is brilliant if you ever get a chance to see it, which contextualizes enslavement and its aftermath through drama by writing and commissioning work based on stories from the site-specific site of the African burial grounds in Manhattan. So that gives a whole different angle. She's also a teaching site-specific theater at Drew University. And um, in addition to being a playwright, Judy's won four Emmys and a Writers Guild Award for her work in television. And she is also an astonishing playwright, many plays that have been produced, and and is the founding artistic director of a program at Manhattan Theater Club that works with um, justice-involved youth. Uh, so, Judy. Yes. <laughs> Hello. How are you? Hi. Good. I was just having so many connective thoughts when I was listening to everyone and, and you know, real and realizing, too, just how that is exactly how creativity works. That's exactly how ideas happen. Uh, with the um, with unheard voices, not a great title, but <laughs> which was the um, first original work that American Slavery Project created and produced. I was sitting in the um, I was sitting at the um, African burial ground, in, you know, um, there's a wonderful sculpture there that looks like a boat that is just rammed into it, you know, like a slave ship that's just rammed into uh, the um, docks and, and there is the um, libation chamber, they call it outside. And therefore, for those of you who have not been to the uh, African burial ground in lower Manhattan, let me just explain to you what it, what it is. In about 1994, 419 bodies were discovered as they were excavating for a federal office building down there. And uh, this is the site of... Uh, an, a burial ground that was open roughly from 1690 to 1790 outside of the city limits of New York at the time, because they were forced to bury their dead out um, enslaved people and even non-enslaved, but African descended people were forced to bury their dead outside the city limits. And it was an old Lenape uh, burying ground. And so I was sitting there after, I, I had actually gone down when they discovered this because the drummers, I lived downtown and the drumming was so 
amazing and it was so um, calling that people were just coming down, following the drums to the African burial ground. So my husband and my, my daughter and I, you know, went over there and it was an amazing, an amazing, it was an amazing, spontaneous offering to whatever is holy and mourning for these people whose lives had not been acknowledged. And so later after the, after, you know, years later, after there were a lot of arguments about what are we gonna do with this site? I believe really clearly that that's why David Dinkins was off in, in office for those 14 years. New York City's only black for four years, New York City's only black mayor. <laughs> they well, we have a black decided, mayor now. Let's just well, put, yeah, okay. <laughs> but <sure>. go ahead. <laughs> well, you know what I mean, up until that time. <laughs> and so so they built a museum and a monument. And so years later, I was in the monument, and what they had done. Uh, was 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 get Howard University um, to come up and really organize the bones and these burials because when they were coming up out of the ground being excavated things were going everywhere so thank God for Howard University and them having this wonderful um, department that understood archaeology and anthropology so they came up organized everything and now there are these organized photographs of burials, 419 of them. And uh, they could tell from the bones about what era each individual lived in. They could tell from the pelvic bone, whether they were male or female, we're, we're talking sex here, not gender. We could, um, they could tell what, what kind of work they did. They could tell from the teeth and the chemicals in the teeth, whether they were directly from a West African country, if they had been seasoned in the Bahamas and, you know, the West Indies, or if they had, you know, how, what their disposition was. So I was sitting there after this thing was made and each one of those nine, you know, 419 burials had, had a, um, an engraving in the ground. And I said to myself, whoa, th these look like tombstones, except for one thing, there are no names. And so I said to myself, this is, this is a job for artists. This is a job for writers. We make people. And here are people who are unheard, unmade, unvoiced. So I um, got a few grants and I commissioned um, 17 playwrights at the time. Um, oh, people like Dominique Morisseau, um, Keith Joseph Adkins. <laughs> Um, many, many people. I mean, <laughs> you can go to my website and find out the whole thing. And a dramaturg uh, and I and a director, Melissa Maxwell, uh, dramaturg Sean Renee Graham, we met with historians. We met with um, park, this wonderful park ranger, Ranger Cyrus, who has an uncanny, well, he's got a PhD and he's got an understanding of history. And we... Um, asked people to pitch us three ideas to write about this, uh, somebody, you know, um, that a burial signified. And then we created a performance piece um, uh, that was originally intended to be performed, well, we, you know, in, at, at the African burial ground. Um, but because the African burial ground was over a lake, <laughs> it was really, it was built, you know how it's been built up. There was water running under the African burial ground, and therefore there were a lot of rats. This is a New York City tale, right? There's a lot of water underneath <laughs> New York City. And so there were rats, and they had to close it down. I'm like, oh, God, what are we going to do? <laughs> we were supposed to perform right there, and you close it down. So we went to our friends. We went to our friends at um, the uh, Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz Center, and we did a performance. Our very first performance we ended up doing there on the site of Malcolm X's assassination, which is sort of an amazingly powerful thing to do. You're t you know, we bring in, we brought in stones, <laughs> just like a burial. We had a complete circle. And so this, what was going to be a performance piece has turned into 
a holy ceremony and we always perform it as a ceremony. We have an African um, singer and priestess uh, sing with us. Um, everyone comes in, all of the people who perform the monologues come in bringing offerings to, and a burial, we, we, we make a, a makeshift burial and they bring uh, a libation, they bring something, um, a plant of the season, they bring a doll um, and they bring cowrie shells, which of course were in many of the graves and you know people threw them out. So we always, wherever we perform this, we always perform it as a ceremony that way. Um, so we did that at Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz uh, uh, Center, and we've done it uh, the most, I'm just not, we've done a lot of places, but the most interesting places, we, we have worked several times at the um, New York Historical Society. So we've done it, they That's have a kind of a stage. Yeah, but they have a library there that is round, has a space where you can make a round space. <laughs> So that because what we want is we don't want to have a separation between the people represented that are buried and the people witnessing, because that's what we consider it. We consider it um, a witnessing, um, something that we're in together as opposed to a performance piece. And I think the most connected and interesting thing we do is we have parchment paper. And so as people who come in to the space, whatever space we're doing it in, we give them parchment and they write down the names of loved ones that they have lost. And then we give that to the singer who puts it into the bowl that she carries in behind all of the performers who you know have their um, offerings. And she carries the name of the dead of all the people in the space and um, puts that on the makeshift grave. Oh, I'm getting chills because it's just. <laughs> it's an amazing, you know, it's an amazing <laughs> piece. But what I didn't know until now is that you, you, you use every venue as sort of its own site and ad adapted. Yes. To that. So, so it's exactly. kind of like a tour, yeah. you know, like we I kind of have to do that sometimes when you're touring and, you know, you end up at a community yes. center that. Yeah. That's great. Exactly. We've made every single site. A, a space of commune and that, that's you know, fantastic that's so speaking of commune let me just see if Bela has any questions that she can um put forward from people who are listening Bela? hi uh yeah we have a couple questions um can can someone speak to um the necessity of getting permissions from the city or the location if, it, if it's not a museum that you're working um, collaboratively with, but if you're if you're just doing something in a city or town, are there any permissions needed, et cetera? Anne has a response. Yeah, I mean, I think it, there's not one answer to this. Um, so um, during the pandemic, we also did, David Greenspan did a, a cabaret on the stoop of my brown and we closed off the street. And we, we work with the community policing department to do that. There's also the street activity permits office, but they're kind of the bureaucrats who like fill out the form and make sure that it's okay. But the people who are really helpful are the community policing folk in your particular neighborhood. Then there's also the- This is in New York. This is in New York City, yeah. yeah. And there's also the business improvement districts. So it really, um, First of all, I do have to say, uh, in terms of all of this, I think there really needs to be a reason why one does site-specific work. There is it's absolutely much more difficult, costly, complicated, dealing with rain, dealing uh, outdoors, dealing with rain, dealing with theft, you know, all of this stuff. There's a reason why they build theaters. They have lights, they have a roof, they have sound. So, <laughs> Um, and one of the important things I always say is if you fight the site, it will win. So <laughs> we had a beautiful group of artists do something in the history, Natural History Museum down in Washington, D.C. a thousand years ago. And it was so echoey, it became really difficult to um, to have the piece be popular. So, you know, doing site-specific work, it's not something you want to say, 
oh, I'll just go do that. I'll just take my play. It's written for a bar. I'll put it in a bar. Big mistake. <laughs> it mm -hmm. really needs to be a part of the core essence and the why of, of why you're doing it in the first place. And if it isn't, run a theater. <laughs> That's my opinion. Okay. And so, um, yeah, but right. so New York City is probably one of the more complicated places, and especially since 9 11, a lot of security issues, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, may I just may I just add to that? <laughs> why this play? Why now? Why this space? Um, we we do unheard voices everywhere but theaters almost. <laughs> you know, I mean the museums. Is, but also one of the things you have to think about is we were working in a church, and I went to see the space. It was gorgeous, right? And and can you imagine giving in a church. It was in Harlem, a church in Harlem. We did a, a three show tour. <laughs> and then we got there to do the play and the me, <laughs> all that wonderful light that was <laughs> coming into the windows <laughs> was no longer there. And the lights they had did not illuminate the space. So I was running around a couple of hours before the, <laughs> the performance and I ended up getting these con contractor lights, these huge <laughs> contractor lights and plugging them in. So, I mean, it was a very wonderful and eerie thing, but oh my goodness, you know, go look at the site you want to work in at the time of day <laughs> that you want to work in. It. Okay, so let's see, Bela, another question? Yeah, there's some curiosity about whether or not folks are accepting permissions. And Pepper, you mentioned that there might be some opportunities. So I'm wondering if you want to elaborate on that and if anyone else has um, suggestions or ideas or resources about submissions, that would be great too. Uh, yes, the submissions. So I would mention Nicole Edelman. She and I met in LA and we both moved to Europe and started our theater company. And we are going, we're looking to produce and program for 2024 and 2025. So we are definitely open to supporting this community in particular. And um, yeah, so send anything to us. I put my email is in the chat. It's pepperc at gmail, P-E-P-P-U-R-C at gmail. And Nicole is Nicole J. Edelman, A-D-E-L-M-A-N, number seven at gmail.com. And you can find us. I'll put our, our theater uh, site too. But yeah, I'm totally open. I'm a writer and I also love working with writers. Send, send us along. Let's talk. So Pepper, are, there, is, are those for site-specific productions? Yeah, they end up being site-specific because we work with a studio in Prague and it's called Studio Sabets and then we transform it. So we call it site-specific because really it's an art studio. It kind of, Well, it's, it's a performance I'm the speaking. It's a space for community to gather. And we 100%, we did Streetcar in there. We did Glen Gary, Glen Ross. We did a, my one woman show and we turn it into theater. And we, we we start the show outside, we bring it in. So yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I've got- Judy, Ann, do you have, uh, how do you connect with writers? How do we connect um, with writers? Go ahead, Ann. Yeah, I mean, I have a program called Uncommon Voices. Um, well, I have two things, one which doesn't really fit this group. So I do um, performances in my backyard, but they're for early career artists. Um, we have early you. career artists. We have people I thought it levels. was for women only over 40. So some people start at 40. Well, that's true. Okay. <laughs> stand corrected. Stand corrected. Anyway, yeah, I want to get a tattoo that is always emerging, but I'm too chicken. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so basically what we have done is we have guest curators curate three um, pieces that are short excerpts of new work, and we perform them in our backyard. Um, and um, everything, I, the one thing I would say to everybody on this, in this group, that is really, really important um, in terms of zooming out for a second, um, is it's really important that you know and are familiar with the organization that you're going to reach out to because there are, I mean, even in LinkedIn, sometimes somebody, I'm doing a film. I don't do film, you know, and it's very important that you know what we 
what each organization does and how they do it and what they care about because otherwise it takes a lot of mental and emotional energy and um, time to be reaching out to a lot of people when you don't understand that. Um, and so, but we, you know, we have an, the way we have the play date in our backyard and then we have a, a series called Uncommon Voices where we commission new work, but it's all about um, new forms of storytelling for um, theater at the intersection of social change. A lot of what we do has multimedia. So we don't take conventional plays. Okay, Mabu, come over stuff. and eat. Ever. <laughs> Judy, Susan, do you have a quick response here? Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I absolutely agree with that. A lot of people reach out to us with never having gone to even our website. And, you know, when, when I started the American Slavery Project, it, um, we actually started the year before because there were three main stage productions in New York about the era of enslavement and not a single one of those writers was black. And I had an entire community of writers <laughs> and we're like, what the, you know? And so we decided to give a read. We had a reading series from uh, Black History Month to Juneteenth. We did each one of our plays uh, and different theaters gave us space. And we, it was the it was a series, the American Slavery series. I said, well, I want to keep this going. And that's how the American Slavery Project kept going. And then Unheard Voices was our first original piece. But the idea that Africa, you know, back then, I think it's better now. And I want to say partly due to, you know, our advocating. But if you are a writer in white spaces, I'm probably not as interested in your work as if you were a writer of color who has a deep connection to this era and to this material. And that just is the way it is. You know, our, we're looking not, we're not looking for a, a, a different gaze than that, you know, and, um, you know, people ask me, well, do, you, know, you know, there's that whole thing that, you know, well, isn't that racist? I'm like, no, <laughs> it actually is not. It is actually opening the door for people whose vo voices have, have been marginalized for a long, long time and have a particular connection, you know, now, um, I will read people's stuff and I have a reader and um, sometimes I will not disclose, <laughs> you know, who, who, who they are. If, if the person, you know, has written me, but pri yes, it's authenticity. Thank you. Anne Meredith swordfish. <laughs> we're, we're, talk okay. we're talking about, yes. And, and, and Carol Carter. <laughs> okay. All so right. does that make sense? So uh, yeah. Susan, do you, uh, have you ever opened up to other writers or you stick with what you know. Yes. Yeah, so hi. Yes. Um, so yes, Hudson Classical Theater Company started off and it is a classical theater company. So we do classical works. Uh, like I said, we do Dumas, we do Shakespeare, Jane Austen, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because of course it's um, public domain. It's, it's free. Um, when I came on board in 2010, um, coming from the Writers Guild, I showed up and said, where are the living writers? And they're like, no, 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 we just do dead writers. And I'm like, uh, okay, that's great, but I want to see some living writers. <laughs> so um, one of the things I, I, I uh, did uh, when I joined this company was start something called WAG, Writers at Go Go, where we um, asked for submissions for playwrights. And uh, we got, uh, and the whole point was to sort of um, workshop these plays. Um, and during the years that we did WAG, which is uh, pretty successful, we I had 11 um, play readings um, of new playwrights, um, all playwrights, not just new play, playwrights. And then we actually um, actually uh, did a full production of one of these plays. Um, since then, we kind of lost our indoor space. So we're looking for another indoor space because we would like to um, revive WAG and, and continue doing it. We'd stopped in WAG because okay. You know, it's expensive to rent indoor spaces. Um, so right. you know, it, it's it's you know. But once we can find a space to do it again, we would love to um, be a classical theater company 
and also have this branch called WAG where we support living playwrights. Okay. So I'm going to keep moving and keep uh, because we've got more things planned, but, but I just want to go around once and see if you have any tips, starting with Pepper, if you have tips or final thoughts or, uh, you know, something you just are bursting to say. Interesting to say by this question about permission and all of that, um, that is almost why I do site specific theater because I'm like I want to go where 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 something hasn't been done or where I'm not going to be asked to do a bunch of things. I I just want to present art sometimes. So I in that with the message in that is go with your soul, go with your creativity, see what you can find, and um and and yeah, just see what you can find that doesn't have so many requirements. So I hope that okay. Comes and Pepper hard. Pepper also has a, a um a consultancy or business organization that uh, does uh, inspiration for women creatives, I guess. Yeah. Um, Anne, final uh, tips. I mean, I would just say, you know, I think, you know, it's just repeating what I already said, which is some of the shows I do are site specific. Some of them are not. And um, uh, I always look at, um, really given that i work with such a broad variety of artists like i try our creative development and commissioning process is really about uh creating a bespoke development process that's that's unique to each artist and individual i mean we live in such a gig economy and whether i like it or not like anybody who's a creative producer is to a certain degree a gatekeeper and given when I do um, work with artists, I really want to have a deep seated and meaningful relationship with them that considers the whole person. So it's not just about, you know, giving them some money or, you know, popping in to give them dramaturgical support, but really like what other questions do they ha have? What are they, what are they, what are their long term goals and how can on guard arts um, really help to support them in in who they are as an artist what they care about and dig into the deeper questions of the why of what they do okay susan and i know we're not getting to everybody's questions in the in the audience but um that's just a function of like we could go on for like a weekend conference um as opposed to this consolidated period so susan do you have any last minute tips um, well, I'd like to say uh, two things if possible. Uh, first of all, I just want to say um, we have been doing site-specific um, theater in Riverside Park on the Upper West Side of New York. Um, there's a Soldiers and Sailors Monument. It's on West 89th and Riverside Drive. Um, it's an old Civil War monument. And if you go behind it, it's, there's a very beautiful patio space and the steps of the monument are where people sit. You can sit on the benches on the patio. So that's our site specific space. It's next to the Hudson River. It's, it's, it's a very beautiful space. And what I want to tell people um, or advise people, if you have the privilege to do outdoor theater, especially we do it in a, in a public park, respect the space. Um, we spend hours every day before we start the show cleaning the space. When we get back to the space, it's always covered with broken beer bottles, trash left behind by people. There's dog messes. There's, I mean, the, the space is wrecked every day because it's a public park. But we go in there and we make the space better than when than when we, you know, um, arrived. Also, at, 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 after our shows, there's often a bloodbath on, on the patio. There's just like so much blood. And we clean that blood after every show. So we do a lot of cleaning before and after shows. Fake and blood, I hope. <laughs> yes, lots of big blood. So the next morning when people are walking by the space um, with their dogs, it's a clean space and they would never know the bloodshed that happened just hours before, the night before. So I just want to say we really respect um, and honor the space that we are in and we just want people to really, you know, respect the space that you're in if you're doing outdoor theater. And number two, I just want to say I think we need live theater now more than ever. I feel like art is the great unifier and I know we all believe this, but I just wanted to share with you um, when uh, we've also done a lot of performances in jails. We've been at Rikers, we've been in Manhattan, um, um, Brooklyn, but up in the Bronx. And uh, just to say, share, when we did the uh, Bronx, we did Trojan Women in the morning and then we took a lunch break and then we went back in the afternoon and did Trojan Women again. And somehow between the first and second shows, worked it out that we're doing theater. And these inmates heard 
wanted to see theater. They just really wanted to see theater. And a lot of these, these inmates uh, belong to gangs. They're like the blood and the crypts and they're, and they're very violent and they're not allowed to be in the same space. And they begged the, the correction officers, please, we promise to be peaceful. We promise not to fight. We just want to see live theater. Because they've never had this. Mm -hmm. This is only the first chance to see live theater. And I thought, wow, there's any um, um, case for unifying, <laughs> live theater unifying, that, that's a beautiful example right there. And so when we went back there in the afternoon, there's like over 200 inmates in the gymnasium that, that they were performing. And they were just, they were so appreciative. They're so happy. And another thing too, they said when they, and we heard this in all the jails, they said, when you're in jail, you just cut off your feelings. You don't emote because you just can't, it's, 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 it's too scary to emote. But for 90 minutes, they're able to have feelings for the first time in months or, or years. And they said it felt so gratifying to feel. And so, and also some of these inmates said that they had seen our performances in Riverside Park because we don't sell tickets. Oh, wow. We everybody. And so they, they even said, we've seen your shows. And we were so grateful to see a show of such um, value in production um, when I was so broke. So I just feel like doing live theater at that level, that's the satisfaction of it. Okay, so you're making like... the case for theater, period. Okay, <laughs> Judy, <laughs> do you have a, a, a minute thought? Uh, uh, yeah, I have, whoops, am I, am, yes. Um, we, we never got to get to this, uh, but I know a lot of people out there, if you're a playwright, you have another job and probably it may be teaching. And, um, if you want to try out stuff, <laughs> teaching, working with young people is the best place to try out an idea. I did this wonderful site-specific piece over a 300-acre space in Maine when I took my daughter to camp. <laughs> and I had these young people, I collected their dreams. We did, and I called it Dream Theater. And all we didn't analyze, we didn't do anything. We just collected these dreams and staged them. And, you know, at dusk and people were walking, they were following all through the camp. You know, you put little tea lights and paper bags and you have a, a dream like Stations of the Cross and just these images and, you know, and it was amazing. We did wonderful things, sound collages in the woods and, it was something I came back to New York and went, you know, this is, <laughs> this, this is a good, this is a thing, you know, and if, you, and you can work out, work out ideas for very little um, stress or very low stakes in yeah. a way. It's high stakes for the young people. And I, and we, at Drew University, we do a whole unit on site specific theater, finding spaces around the university and being able to allow right. kids to um, do original material or or already made material. Yeah, right. Well, I love what you said and other people said and how people have built on each other about just like opening up our creativity in lots of different ways. So in that spirit, I knew there were so many people in honor roll that had done this type of work. I invited three people to give really short presentations two minutes um and we're going to start with uh and yes could you call on carol real quick would that bother you too much or not bother you but could you call i just want to say one quick 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 thing which is i just have to give props to on a roll because um i think i came to one of the first meetings and i was like i i have to admit i was kind of cynical i was like i don't think this is going to burn itself out really quickly and what you guys have done has been so amazing. I mean, the fact that there are like almost 50 people in this thing and that you've powered forward and you have a social media presence. So I just didn't want to let it go by before I was like, oh, okay, here. thank you, thank you. I mean, really so amazing and so needed and so important. So I just wanted to quickly say that. Sorry okay. for interrupting you, Pepper. Yeah, Carol, um, did you want to say something quickly? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Cindy, for welcoming me into the honor roll. And thank you for all this. It's really just great. Um, 
for Pepper and for Susan Lee. Um, I am a retired criminal defense attorney who practiced in the Bronx for 33 years. So I really know about the criminal justice system. The first play that, that's my baby. The first play that I worked on um, with a playwright, I'm sure you know his name. His name is Jeremy Carrigan. He wrote Lifespan of a Fact. He's my, which was on Broadway. So he's my playwriting teacher. Well, Carol, anyway, do you have a, qu do you have a quick you. question? Because we, well, we, no, no, I just want to say that this play that I wrote, because I know the criminal justice so well, is about an African American man who was falsely accused of rape in the first degree by a woman he did not know. So all I'm saying is, and I've worked, you know, on it for like four or five years. If you're interested in looking at it or reading it, um, I would right. appreciate it. All right, Joe. I think if you look in the chat or you look at the link to their their site, you can get their emails, and that will be the best way, probably, to reach out to them. Yeah, and thank you, Judy. Look, also, thank okay. you, Judy. And um, so, Melissa Bell, she get back hi. on? Yeah. All right. hi. Hi, Cindy. Thanks for inviting me. I'm Melissa Bell, and I have worked on site-specific things since about 2016. Um, I worked on farms. I currently work with Farm Arts Collective, and we've been on we work on a farm in Damascus, Pennsylvania. And I do agree that there's a reason to do things. Like when we're on the farm, we include the farm. It's almost like a character, you know. So we walk around the farm. Um, we do things that talk about climate change or ecosystems, um, farming as much as we can. Um, but it's also a community that comes together and devises the work together. So although I'm a more trained playwright, I often help with the dramaturgy and make sure everything really does make sense. And, you know, but we devise a lot together. So it's a very community building experience. And then I've also had my plays that I've just written, uh, you know, myself solo, uh, performed in Central Park um, by <sighs> Barefoot Shakespeare at Summit Rock, which is a real beast to perform at. But but I really liked what Susan Lee said, which was like, you, you're in the late August and the sun is going down and my play Lady Capulet ends in the tomb, just like Romeo and Juliet. And there it is. You've got all the lights from Central Park and it's just really, it, it just enhances what you're doing. So you really do have to have a reason. I've worked on Governor's Island and that was kind of a military type of thing. We did Courage and we had stilt walkers being the, the army walking through. And it, it, the best part is people are saying as well is your audience just comes, you know, they're there. We're often part of a festival or we're part of, or we just put it out like these are when we're playing and people are either there or they come specifically for it. Um, I'm up on the Delaware. So people don't have access to theater. Like they really don't. So when they come out to these festivals and there we are at like the festival of wood in milford pennsylvania you know we're on a little stage out there and then we're the stilt walkers coming out and we have all kinds of banners and it's it's big it's it's spectacle and they they just haven't seen it and we have song and everything and it's all original and so you're really having to um be out with the people and you're really identifying with them and bringing them in and bringing them theater. And I agree, it is so rewarding to be that way. I've been in New York and, you know, as we all have and done, re you know, and five people show up in your, in your theater. But when I'm here in Pennsylvania, Northeast Pennsylvania on the Delaware, there are crowds of people that come. We had 300 people at our Dickens on the Delaware performance um, this Christmas, and people were just so happy. To we need out. a bus. We needed a bus trip out there. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, two hours from New York. It's actually pretty cool to come up for a day. I, I've, I've seen it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, I've seen Melissa's work in Central Park, and it was really beautiful. So that was fun. Uh, yeah. Hortense is going to be next. And uh, I think she's going to want to do a, a slide share. 
Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to. And thank you for off the screen here. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this presentation. Um, my name is Hortense Gerardo. I'm the director of the Anthropology Performance and Technology Program at the University of San Diego. And um, I wanted to share, I, I don't know if I can share still. I don't see a share button. Um, I think you can. Let me, I'm trying to. Do you have to make her a co-host, uh, Jenny? Sure. Let me. So I'll just start talking so that I don't use up all my time. <laughs> um, <laughs> But We're flipping along. <laughs> um, I've been doing um, a lot of, um, oh, here we go. See, now remove spotlight. I don't think I can share though. Hmm. Okay. Well, can, share now? can I share now? I, I will go on the participant site and see if it allows me. Uh, I don't see a share button. I might just, I At guess. At the bottom of your screen. Um, after participants, it should say share screen and you click on that. It's uh, usually in green. It's usually uh, highlighted in green. Yeah, no, I like I, at I, the bottom at the bottom of the uh, page. It's not there. You don't see it. I know how to share. <laughs> I've no, never no. Oh, here we go. Share screen. You don't have to tell us about it then. There we go. There we go. Yeah. There. Yay. Can you see my screen now? <laughs> Uh, can yes, you see it? it? Yay. Okay, great. So I'm just going to like um, jump through it. I'm going to put it on. Um, I can't even see where is the share screen mode here because there's not enough space. <laughs> um, here we go. All right. There. You can see that now? Great. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is called a case study in playwriting and ethnography. And um, how do I move forward? I can't now move forward. Okay, um, at the time that I wrote this, uh, this site-specific informed interactive immersive play on the Medfield Anthology, I was the artist in residence at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. So this was a commissioned piece. And I was commissioned specifically to create a work of this art- This is in LA? In Ma no, this is in Massachusetts, Medfield, Massachusetts. Okay. And I was commissioned to create specifically a work of art about the former Medfield State Hospital. The town residents had bought the property from the state in 2015 and was divided over the ensuing four years about what to do with it. The campus of the former Medfield State Hospital, or MSH, for the criminally insane was composed of 35 buildings on 425 acres of prime real estate adjacent to the Charles River. Half the town residents were in favor of preserving the campus in its original state to serve as a testament to its significance in terms of its groundbreaking history of innovation in mental health care and for its architectural significance. It um, was built like a campus, had several buildings on it um, with Italian you know, bricklaying and slate roofs that, blue slate roofs imported from um, Italy. It was just uncommonly beautiful. Uh, there were rare common beech trees on the campus that were um, shipped from in the 20th century from China. And the only other trees of that type are in the Boston Arboretum. However, the cost of maintaining the site was draining the resources of the town. And in the ensuing years, the buildings fell into disrepair and were a site of vandalism. And as a way to fund the mounting upkeep and security needs of the property, while residents could not decide what to do, the place was rented out as a set of various films. Um, here you see Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese on the set of Shutter Island. And in the background, you see the, the chapel on the campus. Um, but they would usually just come in and build fake, you know, facades and there's plastic shrubbery there. And they would move in, do their film and move out. So it wasn't sustainable. So um, as, a, as an anthropologist and as a playwright, I knew that I needed to gather data from the local residents, but there, it was highly stigmatized. Everyone assumed all I wanted to talk about was, you know, how this housed the criminally insane and nobody wanted to talk about it um, until I realized that people actually were using the space for social functions. And they didn't even connect that the fact that it was being used as a public space for like parkour, walking their dogs, you know, riding horses um, until I was able to connect with some of the local residents, which I did by conducting ethnographic surveys at a weekly jazz concert that was held in the middle of town. Um, thanks to the help of a local gallery owner who would host free Thursday jazz lunches, he let me set up a table where I was able to talk with volunteer informants or um, 
um, cultural consultants is what we call them now. And then people were willing to start talking about it when I, they realized I didn't want to just gather archival information about you know, mental health and the in the hospital. So here was the program. In the background, you see on, on our archival footage of some of the nurses that were there at the at the hospital. And here is a, a list of scenes of the play that I created, highlighting um, the actors from the town who ended up wanting to be in the play. So in ten scenes or nine scenes, we have you see several actors who had provided personal information about the piece. Um, the, the, the performance ran, um, was critically praised. And what happened was in the months that ensued, instead of 30 residents going to the town hall meeting and fighting neck, and, you know, neck to neck and never coming to a decision, over a thousand people came. And what they did was they were still neck and neck about what to do, whether to just destroy the whole property or build new, um, you know, like new housing and retail space. They decided they agreed to bring in some architects to um, make some good proposals. And um, in the end, like the final production was canceled because of COVID, but it was adapted into um, um, like a Zoom performance and we were able to get rehearsals. I'm trying to turn it into an augmented reality piece because we were able to film several of the scenes at the site. And um, the end result is that the town now has um, voted to convert the former chapel and the infirmary into a new performing arts center. So this is a good example of how socially engaged site-specific informed art can actually have a very positive social effect. And wow, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. And that's Thank all. you all so much for sharing that. Yeah, I'm really glad to know about that. That's wonderful. Thank you. And um, next up, we have Stacy Chaikin, and I think she's also going to do a screen share. Uh, Jenny? Yeah, Stacy, can you? Let me see. Yeah, I can. Thanks. Hang on and Stacy is uh, in Detroit. Formerly in LA, mm -hmm. and go. Okay. Um, let's see. Just give me one sec. Um, so, um, I served as the. Let's see if you can hear this a little bit. I served as the international creative director for the 20th commemoration of the genocide in Rwanda. Uh, the producers told me the government wanted to create a new narrative, which they didn't really want to do. But they also said that they wanted to include both Tutsi, which is the ruling minority, which was targeted during the genocide, and the Hutu majority. It was an extremist Hutu government that perpetrated the genocide. In order to do this, they wanted to start events a thousand, no, 100 days before April 7th, which was the day in 1994 when the killing started. The president once described the spirit of Wanda as a flame that could never be extinguished. So I got the idea of creating a new flame in the capital, Kigali, and touring it through the 30 districts of Rwanda. In each district, there would be an event where the community receives the flame, creates a place for it to stay alive. Now, where should these events take place? Traditionally, commemorative events take place in memorials, which are places where people died. Their schools, churches stacked still with bones and skulls of the dead. And Hutu don't go there. I said no, if we want everyone to feel welcome, the events have to be in stadiums, in town squares, places where people live. So for three months, they continued to send me lists of memorials, and I said no, until finally a woman who was in the cabinet raised her hand in a meeting, and she said, no, 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 we only go to places where people live, which is what made the flame tour possible. We created a template. The flame arrives in the back of a white pickup with a police escort. It's contained in a miner's lamp that I got from people who supply the Olympics, followed by a caravan of hundreds of cars people on foot, bicycles. They sing the song we created that you heard at the beginning, and I'll play a little bit of now. The song was in the radio, it was taught in schools. They heard miraculously short testimonials, usually testimonials last an hour, three hours, from local Tutsi survivors, 
yes, and Hutu rescuers and Hutu perpetrators. And none of this would have been possible had we not chosen those places where people actually go together, where people live. Thank you. Yeah, I will, Stacey, I think you have a video or something that people can look at. I wasn't able to hear the music. I don't know if other people could. Um, um, here. Can't hear it. Can you see it? I see it. I don't hear it. But I know you have a video. I believe you have a video. If you could put that in the chat. so Are that you, we... Yeah. I will do that. But thank you. I mean, because the international work, um, and I know some other people here have done that, it's just so powerful and important. So what we're going to do for um, the next 10 minutes is go into breakout groups because I believe in breakout groups. It's just an opportunity for people to talk together in groups of three or four or five and share something they've done, something they've seen or something that, that has impressed them in this time period. You again have to like, you know, make sure everybody speaks. You only have like 10 minutes. So that means everybody has to be like on their most crisp, briefest conversation. And I think Jenny, our beautiful, LA playwright web person is going to put us into breakout groups. <laughs> yeah.